So I want to get a start, uh, actually a feel for everybody in here so I can get an idea of what kind of athletes we're talking to. And also, does anyone follow a gluten-free diet? We came in to learn more about gluten-free cooking, right? And so some people do follow gluten-free diets either for celiac disease, a gluten intolerance, or a wheat allergy. And so those are, those are three reasons somebody would follow a gluten-free diet for um, a health concern. Some people like to follow gluten-free diets that don't have these health concerns, and the reason for that is sometimes it makes you feel better. You know, the way that we consume wheat is in a very large abundance of consumption, right? So many places that wheat is. And it does kind of feel a little bit better sometimes to remove that wheat. And so I'll teach you a couple of different ways, you know, if it is celiac disease, if that's your concern if it's a, a gluten intolerance, if that's your concern, or if you just overall want to learn how to cook better, you know, without gluten, or you just want to learn how to cook better in general. That water exploded, huh? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's gluten free. It's yeah. Well, great. Uh, is there any elite athletes in the room, like really intense athletes? No? All right, so good. So we're, we kind of have recreational athletes in here. That'll also give me a gauge on how I talk about, you know, diet planning and also the different levels, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats in the diet, depending on what your activity level is, depending on your type of um, sport, it's gonna be a little bit different. Can I Yeah, question? perfect. I was gonna say, if, if you're at any point you have any questions, feel free to chime in. So that first line, cooking with superfoods, uh -huh. I know for me, like, when I wanna cook, I want them to leak. I want them to drench my cells with nutrition. Mm -hmm. So yeah. any way you can incorporate that, that in. And Family and I love any way I can throw cheese seeds or whatever I need to throw in there to just have that not only flavorful, not only have your macronutrient balance or okay. whatever, but how do you does cooking destroy the benefit into the body? You know, any of that. Kind All of right, stuff. awesome. Yeah, no, that's so a good gonna... that's a good point to consider too. And that's one thing in my background. I have a unique background being a, a dietitian as well as a chef, and also a unique background. Some of the classes I, I teach, I teach culinary arts at the university level. I've taught in two different culinary schools, different parts of the country, teaching young culinarians how to incorporate culinary nutrition, right? They're gonna be the new wave of chefs, how to teach them a little bit better. And so one thing that's interesting about my background is I can work with athletes, right, and teach them how to, to put 2,500 calories in a bowl of food, but also go back to spa cuisine. That's really what my, where I want my legacy to be in is more spa cuisine, more of the light and healthy sorts of things. So I can teach that same cook how to put, you know, 250 calories in that same bowl, that same types of foods, but really incorporate more phytonutrients, more antioxidants, more superfoods, depending on what the calorie ratio is. And there's so many things that you can do in culinary. So I will definitely incorporate the superfoods. So overall, overview of gluten-free diets. Just gonna give you kind of a basic understanding of what it means to, to follow a gluten-free diet, what are some sources of gluten in the diet, but really more so I'm gonna focus on what are the gluten-free grains that we can incorporate. We have what are superfoods, and so that's a good point to start off with. What is your interpretation of a superfood? In here, anybody have an idea of what are superfoods? Apples with a superman cape on them, what's that? Colorful vegetables, okay. I would say foods that are offering the micronutrient level of saturation for yourselves. Okay. An abundance of vitamins and minerals. Seasonal, fresh, local. Seasonal, fresh, local makes them a superfood? Okay. It's <coughs> a good point. All right. Well, we'll get into more superfoods. And I have a, a variety. Actually, I'm going to show you um, the performance dish I have for a post meal. We have black beans, we have Swiss chard, and we have sweet potatoes, all of which are really, really abundant and phytonutrients, lots of antioxidants, vitamins and minerals. Yep. Um, I don't know if this is classified as a superfood because it's not very tasty, um, but also I have a little corn starch. Okay. Um, so it's a tool for huh. uh, Oh, that's interesting. I'm not even familiar with it. So, like the extends part, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so yeah. So yeah. That to me is a super, super food. Super fuel. I don't know if it's a super food. Okay, so that's a good interpretation, right? So I was, I would say flax seeds. I have flax seeds in our breakfast bar. We're gonna do one thing I didn't talk about that I'll talk about when I get into the demo is I'm teaching three recipes. I'm gonna walk you through a pre-meal, pre-exercise meal, a during exercise meal, and a post-exercise meal. All right, and so those are also gonna carry a different weight, you know, types of carbohydrates we want, the amount of calories we want, um, and also like a little bit of protein. 
So that's something we'll go over. You talked about the cornstarch. And so during a during exercise meal, right, you said an extends bar would be a great workout snack. Um, the one that I'm presenting is going to have flax seeds in it, right? So flax seeds are really high in omega-3 fatty acids. And so that's where the superfood will come in on the dish that I'm preparing there. Athletic performance nutrition, what does it mean to follow an athletic diet? We'll talk a little bit, a little bit about glycemic index and timing of meals, and then we'll go into our cooking demo. So the three um, dishes that I'm going to prepare, right, like I said, is a, a pre-workout snack, quinoa tabbouleh. I have a during exercise snack is going to be a puffed millet power bar. I'm going to do power bites. And then the post is roasted pork with sweet potato and Swiss chard hash with black beans. So those are our three meals, three snacks. Sounds good? You guys are all salivating, I can hear it. <laughs> yes. how, many, how many people still need the recipes? And for those of, that, those of you that came in a little bit late, uh, don't hesitate to ask any questions. If you have any questions, we'll just get an answer right there. All right, so a gluten-free diet. I'm sorry. No, you're okay. So a gluten-free diet, right, is one that we avoid wheat products. Right? So we want to take all wheat out of our diet. One thing that you want to consider, right, is what are sources of wheat in different types of food. Am I killing you walking around all over? No, oh, okay. this is <laughs> Just stand still. So, sources of wheat in the diet. Wheat we would see, bulgur wheat, cracked wheat, spelt, kamut. Those are all forms. Uh, durum wheat is out there. Semolina would be a form. And then rye, barley, and oats. Oats we'll talk a little bit about as being gluten-free. They are actually gluten-free, but they're processed in the same facility as wheat. Mm -hmm. That was the question. That was your question? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, it's our gluten-free. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so where our gluten-free grains come in? So here is our list of different gluten-free grains that are nice alternatives to wheat. Some of them cook similar to wheat. Some of them don't. I would say the, the best way to remember is ones that cook similar to rice. Rice is a pretty easy grain to cook, right? Two to one ratio. So two parts liquid to one part grain. You put them together cold, stir them, bring them to a boil, stir it. Lower the heat, put a lid on, let it simmer for 20 minutes, turn off the heat, let it sit for five minutes with the lid on, and then you're ready to eat it, right? Okay. So just like rice, we can cook quinoa, which we're going to do our quinoa tabbouleh. Any place that you like rice, I, and rice is a gluten-free grain, so there's nothing wrong with rice, but I would really, really recommend incorporating a lot more quinoa into the diet. Quinoa, when we talk about superfoods, it's the oldest ancient, uh, the oldest harvested food on the planet. It's a complete vegetarian protein. The Mayas and the Incas referred to it as the mother grain, right? If the Spanish hadn't come in and beat up Peru, we'd all be eating quinoa rather than rice. And so it's one thing, if there's any changes that you made to your diet, I can recommend it's incorporating quinoa. It's gluten-free, so we have that right off the bat. And there's just so many great applications. It's easy to cook, just like rice. Uh, we have millet, right? So millet you might see in bird seed a lot of times. The birds love it, so do we. It's another gluten-free grain. Cooks very similar to rice in that same sense. You want to make sure that you fully cook millet, um, that all the seeds explode, or else it'll be kind of tough to chew. And then especially if you use it in a cold salad, it'll harden again. And so you want to make sure that you get it, you actually a little bit overcook it. Amaranth we have on the top is going to cook like a porridge, right? So very similar to oatmeal, you just create a, a porridge out of it. it, once it it's very gelatinous, and so it'll, it sticks together kind of like polenta. You can do, uh, again, very a lot of applications to that. Brown rice. So one thing about brown rice, we think about rice that's brown when we think of brown rice, right? But all of your whole grain rices are actually referred to as brown <laughs> rices. What gives that um, rice its color is the bran that's still left on the outside. So if you have Chinese black rice or forbidden rice is a, is a whole grain rice. If you have Bhutanese red rice is a whole grain rice. If you have purple Thai sticky rice, it's a whole grain rice. And so those are all referred to as brown rices. They take a little bit longer to cook than white rice because they're not refined. They still have the outer bran on there. But again, they're whole grains, they're gluten free. Do you have any questions? Um, one thing, so is anyone familiar with Sever Magazine? Yes. So Sever Magazine is a food magazine. A couple years ago they did a, a study how to, how to perfectly cook brown rice. So they cooked it 40 different ways. 
and they decided that the best way, and this works really well for short grain, I found for short grain brown rice, like Japanese short grain brown rice, is you start it cold, bring it to a boil, let it boil for 40 minutes, and then strain it like you would pasta. So you cook it like pasta, like 10 to one ratio, right? Strain it and then put it back in the pot with no liquid and put the lid back on and let it sit for 10 minutes and it's perfectly cooked. It's really nice and chewy. That's how I always pre-cook brown rice because then you can go back and stir fry it. You can use it in a variety Did of different ways. 40 minutes? 40, yeah, so cook it like 40 minutes time. and boil okay. it yeah, for 40 minutes. Uh -huh. So the water amount doesn't necessarily matter, it just has to be a lot. Yeah, it has to be a lot, like yeah. you would cook pasta. And mm -hmm. mm -hmm. then you say you put it back into the pot with nothing. And so you strain it, it and then put it back in the pot, yeah. So the steam kind of steam finishes steam. cooking yeah. it, yeah. yeah. Oats, so oats has a star because if you're going to have gluten-free oats, you need to source gluten-free oats. Right? You can't just get, um, not Uncle Ben's with that guy, Quaker, Quaker oats. Right, because they, they're processed in the same facilities that process wheat. And then, as I'll talk about later on in the presentation, cross-contamination is a huge issue with gluten-free diets. Not necessarily if you're just following a gluten-free diet because you want to, but when we start talking about the wheat allergy, gluten intolerance, and celiac, cross-contamination is a really huge issue. Um, oats, we can do different ways, right? We can make granola, so we can bake it, we can cook it in a porridge and have breakfast cereal. Quinoa, as I talked about, so we already kind of talked about quinoa and ways to use that. Any way you would use rice, you can substitute with quinoa. Tef, so tef is what makes the Ethiopian runners so good at running, right? I'm serious. So the bread, the bread in Ethiopia is called injera. It's made from this, this grain, tef. Tef is a really small black seed, kind of tastes like dirt, um, a little bit. It's, but it's really good. So what do you pair it with? You pair it with chocolate. So chocolate covers up that flavor, right? I, my favorite combination, and I did it actually with our um, with our bites that we're going to do is chocolate and cherry. Mm. That combination of chocolate and dried cherries with almonds, roasted almonds. Really nice combination. I use that a lot. And so I did that today with our, um, with our bites. I do that. So I make teff waffles, right? You use gluten-free flour or the teff flour and um, a little bit of buttermilk and make waffles. You put them in the waffle iron and then you can do whatever you want with there. And those are also a great activity snack, right? Because they're, they're portable. You can make these waffles ahead of time, throw them in a plastic bag and then just eat them on the go. And you're saying that the nutrition, there's a lot of nutrition in that. The reason it's so nutritious, I'm sorry, is because it, it holds on a lot of oxygen. It oxygenates the blood. So it has a lot of iron and it helps to oxygenate the blood. And so that's why it makes the runners so good. Thanks for clarifying that. So in the waffles, when you don't have chocolate on them, do they taste like dirt? No, you can put other things. Um, you make them flavorful. You can yeah. probably add chocolate chips to the waffles. <laughs> That's not the only way. And, and as I, I said, to cover up that flavor. But if you ever have been to an Ethiopian restaurant, mm -hmm. that bread that they give you is called injera. Mm -hmm. I liken it to gluten-free sourdough. So mm -hmm. in, in Africa, they just take the flour with water and then mix it and let it ferment for three days. Right, so there's no leavener in it, and then they make these pancakes, right, called injera, like a really thin bread that's really soft and spongy. Mm -hmm. But you need to be careful in the U.S. because a lot of times it's cut with wheat flour, mm -hmm. so you need to make sure to ask how they make their injera. And then cornmeal. So cornmeal is great. Cornmeal is a gluten-free grain. A lot of times people don't think about cornmeal and polenta being a whole grain because we think of corn as a starchy vegetable. But it is an awesome whole grain. There's a lot of great uses for it. Mm -hmm. One thing that I wanted to emphasize with all of these, right, is to more think outside the box. So let's take rice as our gold standard, because everyone knows rice. We know rice for pilafs in um, entrees and savory applications. We know rice and rice pudding for sweet applications. So every grain has that possibility to be used for breakfast, to be used for lunch, to be used for dinner, to be used for dessert. Right? And so really thinking about the grain as a vehicle for the other flavors, but also as a vehicle for nutrition. All right? and so oatmeal, right? we use oatmeal for breakfast. But has anyone ever had oat an oat um, risotto for dinner, with dinner? So a different application, instead of using rolled oats, you use steel cut oats that are, you know, the Scottish oats that are bigger, and cook them like you would risotto, and then pair it with mushrooms and thyme and Parmesan cheese, and you have a really awesome vehicle for serving lamb. Um, quinoa, like I said, is my favorite across the board, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and uh, dessert. So for me, I would take cooked quinoa, right, add, let's say we add almond milk to it, cook it down again, add some maple syrup, add some dried fruit, add some nuts, great, you know, way to start your day. Complete protein, 
gluten free, dairy free, vegan. Kids love it. And I'm not, that's not my stance to be like gluten free, vegan, everything. My stance is to enjoy food. That's so, that's one thing. And I'm teach, I teach that side of it, but I also teach a lot of different sides of it. And so there's a lot of different dietary factors that go into eating. That's just a really clean way to eat, right? That example I gave with the quinoa. Is there any questions before we move on? Um, like grits. Grits, yep. So just good old southern grits, they're pretty much gluten free. Oh yeah, because it's cornmeal, yep. Mm -hmm. So you can rice. cook them with, what's that? And wild rice? Wild rice. Yep, same thing, gluten free. You know what's really fun to do with wild rice? Is put it in the popcorn maker. It's like a really awesome, crunchy snack, and it's, you know, the quarter, I mean, Popcorn's gluten-free as well, but it's kind of a different application to pop up wild rice. Mm -hmm. Eric, have you found gluten-free still-cut oats? Uh, you know, I, I bet you you could source them. If I looked, I bet you I could. I can't remember seeing it. At this I bet you Bob's Red Mills, that's what I put on there, because Bob's Red Mills has, has a great variety of products, yeah. and they would probably be able to source that for you. So gluten-free concerns, right? So somebody who has celiac disease, and was there anybody in here with celiac disease? So I'm gonna kind of skip over, you do? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna kind of skip over like the nutritional side of that, but I'll go into the, um, the concern for everybody. If you have somebody who's coming into your house to eat, right, and they have celiac disease or any gluten intolerance. So one crumb from a slice of bread is a threshold for tolerance per day for somebody who has celiac disease, right? And so that's, it's 25 micrograms. And so the main thing I want to touch on here is the cross-contamination that goes along with gluten-free diets. So if you have a toaster and you taste gluten-free bread in the same toaster that you toast gluten bread, you're going to have that cross-contamination. If you go home and you take your muffin tins, right, and wrap a paper towel in them, you're probably going to get some residue in there. And so that, just that small amount of flour residue is enough to cause a reaction in somebody who has a gluten intolerance, you know, that has celiac disease or a wheat allergy. So the cross-contamination part is really important. Um, separate pots and pans, you know, make sh making sure things that are labeled, using separate oils, you know, not making gluten-free waffles in the waffle maker that you make the regular waffles, you know, not using the same skillet and spatula that you would make gluten-free pancakes that you're making regular pancakes. Okay. So superfoods. They are. They should be fruits that have capes on them, right? These little foods that are running around, <laughs> super nutritious. So soy, I'll start with soy as both sides. Soy is a great food because it's a, it's gluten free, it's a complete protein from vegetarian source, it's high in protein, it's a high in omega-6 fats, which are an essential fatty acid that we want to get in our diet. Um, so it is, it is really great for that. There's a flip side about soy, you know, it's one of the top, the top eight food allergens, so there's a, a lot of um, reaction that can occur there, as well as a lot of concern with genetic modification in soy, just like we would see with corn. And so there's two sides of soy being a great in, uh, component of our diets. One thing to consider is the way that we eat soy in the US is way different than the way that Asia eats soy. And so we see all these Asian health studies about how soy is a great food in the diet. They might eat an ounce of tofu mixed in with a soup or a salad, Whereas in the U.S., we're going to have eight ounces of soy as the center of our plate that's probably deep fried, you know, or stir fried and absorbs all this oil. And so you want to just think about the ways that you incorporate soy into the diet. For me, the recommendation I would say is eat more edamame, right? Young soybeans, minimally processed. They're the, the most rich in phytochemicals, right? So those are antioxidants. There's two major ones called genistein and diastin that really help lower cholesterol. They help lower your risk of certain types of cancers. And so edamame would be the most superfood form of soy. Oats, so I want to back up for a second because I didn't give you my definition of what is a superfood, right? Why are we talking about all these foods? Superfoods are foods that contain, they're just inherently better for overall health, right? So soy talking about the heart disease, lowering um, certain types of cancers. Oats, we're going to talk about lowering cholesterol. Nuts, there's a lot of vitamins and minerals in nuts, although there's a lot of fat in there. Um, you know, I don't have blueberries, but different types of berries that are up there. And so just in general, superfoods are foods that are really inherent in um, healing properties. That's one of the things I'll talk to you about is the healing properties of food and my view on that. And so that's where the, uh, the superfoods really come in, is just inherently really good for healing. 
and overall health. Um, berries, so we have you know blackberries, blueberries, raspberries. Now we start seeing goji berries, right? Acai berries. And so these are all very, very high in antioxidants. I keep throwing the term antioxidant around. You might have heard antioxidants before. And so what's a good form that we see every day, non-food related source of oxidation? Rust, right? So antioxidants essentially help your body not rust. That's the way, that's the most simple way to think about what do antioxidants do? Help keep your blood clean, help your body not rust, help fight infection, prevent diseases. Uh, fatty fish. So fatty fish are superfood because they're high in omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids are an essential fatty acid. And it's not necessarily that these fish make this nutrient. It actually comes from plankton. It comes from phytosynthesis. And so the plankton is really rich in um, omega-3s. And what happens is those are eaten by krill. The krill are eaten by little fish. And the bigger fish eat those, and it's stored in their fat. So that's where that really comes in. It's the whole chain cycle there. Teas are, teas are really good for your heart, um, depending on if it's black tea, green tea. And then the last one I have there on is garlic. Right? We know garlic's great for lowering your cholesterol. Mm -hmm. I used to eat raw, raw garlic. Kind of stopped doing that. Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, but garlic is really good for your heart. It's purple grapes. Why do you think purple grapes? Yeah. Purple grapes are just rich. They're called poly the same um, phenols that are in tea. Right, the things that we make tea, that's why grape juice is really, really nutritious. Um, the same, not the same study that shows the research like cranberries in fighting um, UTIs, but um, grapes kind of have similar components for great heart health. The red same wine. as red wine, right? Red wine's <laughs> good for your heart, yes, yeah. yeah. All right, do you have any questions about that part? I'm gonna go more into the diet planning side of it. <coughs> So one thing, and I'm a little nervous because I have two other dietitians in the room, what they're going to say. It's always hard, right, when other professionals are watching you present and what you say. And so... Especially with regard to food. Especially with regard to everything. <laughs> yeah, everything. So um, diet's interesting and because we call nutrition a science, right? But everybody's science is different because your body types are all different, right? Your activity levels are different. The foods you like are different. Your allergies are different. And so it's very, your diet is very, very, very subjective to yourself and, and your body type. These are gonna be general recommendations I'll talk about um, overall for diet planning. I'm gonna use standards, right? Our benchmarks that we talk about. But it, it, can, it can really, there can be a huge variance between an elite runner who's gonna have, might have 90% fat in their diet before an activity, right, building up to an event, versus somebody who's a weightlifter, right, and they're gonna have a higher protein diet because they're breaking down muscles so much that they wanna rebuild. And so the guidelines I have there are very, very subjective to what kind of activity you have and what type of body type you have. Um, in general, people in here are gonna have a 2,000, follow roughly 18 to 2,500 calories per day. Somebody that's working out, you know, immensely. We all, I know, probably saw Michael Phelps eating 10,000 calories a day, right, during activity. So again, that'll be kind of subjective. I have here, and I know you can't see the, the little words here, but kind of a, a standard breakdown for good health. And so we want to have a lot of vegetables and fruits in our diet, right? So we have huge amounts of fruits and vegetables. Those are going to be where we get the superfoods from for the most part. One thing, and again, the, I have the dietitians in the room, and we all say, eat the rainbow every day, right? So getting a variety of colorful fruits and vegetables in your day is gonna help really create an abundance of phytochemicals and antioxidants to help for, for overall health. Carb needs, well, so this is an interesting one for this crowd, right? What are our carbohydrate needs and where do we get them? In general, whole grains are gonna be your best source, and so it's really important to look for the gluten-free grains I talked about amaranth, millet, quinoa, teff, oats, right, in their whole grain form. You're not gonna find refined quinoa, you're not gonna find refined millet or refined amaranth. You're gonna see oats. I recommend getting old-fashioned oats if you're gonna have make oatmeal or go into the steel cut oats and start incorporating those because you're gonna get more, more of the bran and the endosperm. When you start getting into quick cut oats, it's pretty much what falls off of the racks, right, when they're sifting the oats because they're smaller pieces, they cook faster. 
it's still essentially whole grain, but you're not, you're gonna definitely get the whole grain if you look for larger forms of oats. Eric, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. So I, when I buy my raw, raw almonds and I put them in my blender and I make my own almond flour, is that different than the almond flour that I would buy at Trader Joe's, for example? Is no, it's the, the same. Doing the exact same thing? It's the so same. Yours is a little bit different for firm. Yeah, yours is going to be a, a, a coarser sure. grind than the flour, maybe. And but is it's the, the same. same for these other grains? Like, you'll find the almond flour, you'll find mm -hmm. their processing. Okay. That's a, good, that's a good point, though, to, um, to move into label reading, because we know I'm recommending whole grains, right? But because something's whole, multigrain doesn't necessarily mean it's a whole grain, right? You might have a multigrain bread, which just means that there's oats in there, that there's wheat in there, that there's quinoa in there. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's all whole grain, right? There could be white rice flour in a lot of uh, gluten-free breads versus a brown rice flour. So that's a good question to look for that. I have a follow-on question to that. So mm -hmm. I tried to make some gluten-free cookies, and I tried to grind up oats to mm -hmm. use oat flour mm -hmm. in a blender, and then it didn't work. Like, it, it just didn't work out. And then I went and I found gluten-free oat flour, and it worked better, and I wasn't sure why that was. And maybe it was just how granular it was. The grind? Um, I wouldn't have the answer for that, because I would think that they're the same, you know, what about it didn't work? They just didn't bind together? Right, exactly. Mm. I don't yeah. know. And I ended up using that Bob's Red Milk because I found it in another, another store and it was great and mm -hmm. it was gluten free and so yeah. it worked and I was like, all right, fine, I have my answer. I found a place where I could buy it, you know? Yeah. But it was no, just I've never strange. Had, I always, because like oat flour and um, almond flour, I always grind. So I would recommend a food processor more yeah. than a blender mm -hmm. because you're going to get a better. Consistency out of it, but um, also the cool thing, like when you do, uh, not that it makes a, a huge difference, but grinding whole almonds versus almond flour, you're going to get a, a little bit of the skins in there, and those there's different vitamins and minerals that you would get from that. I think you can see that in Trader Joe's though; they have little chunks of that skin. In oh, there. really? Yeah. Oh. Um, all right. So food is fuel. So here's a really interesting approach to, to what I do is food is full fuel, but more so is food is medicine, right? I have a, a varied background in different healing diets, Ayurvedic, microbiotic, raw living. Um, now people follow the paleo diet. I guess you would, I wouldn't re super refer to it as a healing diet, but there's a lot of diets, um, the Okinawa diet, right? So all these different diets that are around the world that people use for healing and really look at food as medicine. In macrobiotic, they use the yin and yang of foods, and so kind of like you're balancing your life force energy through your diet. Um, Ayurvedic is eating for different body types, right? So not eating certain foods because they're not good for your body type versus eating other foods because they are really good for your body type. And so again, that's where the, the science of nutrition really is very individual to different people. So food as medicine is where the superfoods come in as well, right? Because there's that abundance of antioxidants, the, the abundance of phytochemicals, but you know, eating, drinking your green tea to, um, for heart health to fight certain types of cancers, you know, to have your oats to help lower your cholesterol, to have your chia seeds, right? Because they're really good in, for having omega-3 fatty acids, which are an essential fatty acid, we need, fatty acid we need to get into our diet. And so thinking about your food as medicine, thinking about the different ways, the different vitamins and minerals, the different antioxidants you're getting from your diet as opposed to looking at outside sources. There are need for some outside sources, depending on what um, type of diet you follow, what your, your nutritional needs are, but really looking at the diet first. And that's where it says, you know, food is a tool, not a toy. Getting into athletes, right? I know athletes that eat 10,000 calories a day, and it's literally like taking their medicine. You know, it's a dreadful experience to get 2,500 calories in in one bowl of food. You know, it's, it's almost like eating out of a serving dish. As your, as your dinner plate at some, sometimes, depending on what the diet is and what you're getting. Any questions there? I'm gonna start moving a little more quickly so we can get into the cooking. So high caloric needs for athletes, lots of, um, lots of activity, more training diets. We wanna make sure that we get in the amount of calories that we need for training so that we're not breaking down all of our body cells, right? You're gonna burn through muscle glycogen first, then you go into fat, and then you want, if, if you get past that, you would atrophy and break down protein, which is not what we wanna do at all. We wanna have an abundance 
of calories in our diet. We want to have an abundance of nutrients so that we don't get to that point because it's a, a chain reaction. Once we start breaking down protein, we start seeing um, it's not just your muscles, but protein's part of all of the cells in your body, right? It's going to affect your hair, your nails, your skin, your eyesight, um, your heart, your veins, your blood. And so we really want to avoid that through the use of, one, through the antioxidants from the superfoods, but also from getting you know, enough calories in the diet. So I touched on the, the uh, long distance runner having 90% fat in their diet before an event. That's, um, we know, carbo loading, so that's fat loading. That's a newer technique, I would say. Um, and then just your general diets, 50% carbohydrate, 20% protein, and then 30% fat. And that we, in the fat, we wanna make sure we're emphasizing unsaturated fats from plant products. So we get 10% monounsaturated, 10% polyunsaturated, and then less than 10% saturated fat. I see you squinting with the question. Do you, does everyone have an understanding of different unsaturated fat versus saturated fat? No, I'm squinting with fat content. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so saturated fats come from animal products. High, they have cholesterol. They're more detrimental to heart health versus unsaturated fat coming from plant products, no cholesterol. And then they're gonna contain, uh, well, not the fats from the plants, but if you have nuts, right? Nuts are gonna contain fiber. If you contain, or if you have like flax seeds, right? Gonna help, they're gonna have fiber in there. And so those are heart healthy types of fats. Avocados are a great example. People are afraid to eat avocados because there's a lot of calories, which is true, right? They're a fat source, but there's tons of vitamin E, tons of folate. Right, they're monounsaturated fat. So what are the functions in athletes? So carbohydrates, right? The carbs are our body's preferred energy source. So we want to have an abundance of carbohydrates for that reason. Fats, we want to have healthy types of fats in our diet. After our body burns through carbohydrates, fats are the next source of our energy. And then we want to have lean proteins, lean proteins for heart health, so that we're not, you know, uh, we're not eating a lot of cholesterol. That's where the lean proteins are coming. So in addition to those foods, some other things that are gonna be important to the diet, using flavor enhancers. Using flavor enhancers is super important because for athletes in general, sodium is less of a concern because you're sweating so much, you're burning through it. Sodium's an essential nutrient in your body, you need to have sodium. But when you start looking at reducing the sodium intake in your diet, Adding herbs and spices to enhance flavor is going to be really important. You know, for me, there's a lot of things that I do that are, are interesting, I would say interesting techniques. You know, using pureed sweet potatoes as a binder to hold it together a couscous salad to incorporate more, you know, nutrients in there. Where you're getting flavor, you're getting um, some color in there, you're getting a different texture. And so really thinking about how you can enhance the flavor in your cooking. Naturally rep replacing the fats, right? So using pureed bananas, um, as a fat replacer in baking, right, to help lower fat bacon. You still want to have some fat. Fat's important in the cooking process. It has a lot of um, important characteristics, but still, if you want to start looking at how to lower that fat, there's some good, some good ways there. And then, as I mentioned, the I mentioned with the grains, really focusing on whole grain products when we look at our carbohydrates, you know, do a little bit more label reading and um, look for where that ingredient is placed on the the label, the further up it is at the top, you know, the more of that whole grain there's going to be in that whole grain bread. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that book that you have for nutrition in the back here, like this? This? Yeah. This is um, the American Dietetic Association. So um, that would be more for for practitioners. You would get some information. Yeah, there's a book, um, I have the name at home. I'll <coughs> my card after this. There's a book for the non-professional about sports nutrition. That would be good for someone who's getting yeah, Thanks for asking. All right, glycemic index. How many people plan their diets based on glycemic effect? I think oh. just, I'm sorry. I think having diabetes over a decade too, do that a little bit mm -hmm. automatically. just automatically not 
know, so. You would or would not? You would not. No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> right. No, I mean, yeah. depends, right? Yeah. Right. So. But you worded that interestingly. Interesting so you didn't, you didn't say how many of you followed Christ's index diet. What did you say? You said how many of you take into account the glycemic effect of your food? Yeah. I do. Right. So that glycemic effect of your food. So thinking about a good example is agave nectar. Right, agave nectar is still high on the glycemic index mm -hmm. the way like other refined sugars are, but it doesn't cause a rapid spike in fall. It causes a more rounded spike. And so that's where I refer to as glycemic effect. And is where does that rise and fall? Yeah, I think yeah. that's where, um, I don't want to put pressure on the registered dietitian. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. I'm just going to run and hide now. <laughs> that's where um, I find that glycemic index is not as helpful as understanding the glycemic effect of the individual person's food choices on their blood sugar. Mm -hmm. Because what affects them will be different as a food choice, as an individual food choice than somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I have people that just look at rice and their blood sugar goes up, and I have people that eat rice at every meal and do fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, it's, an, it's a personalized glycemic effect. Mm -hmm. I love that, well I love that analogy, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kinda keep going through it because it seems like everyone has some, a good grasp of this. But the same thing with cholesterol, right? Some people can eat an egg every day of their lives and have no cholesterol problems, and one pers a person can't eat an egg once a month without their cholesterol skyrocketing. And so that's where the individual diet really comes in, is finding out what works for your body, listening to your body more, and so getting more in tune with if how, how nutrition works for you. All right, is there any questions before I go into cutting things up? I know there's some of you that walked in that don't have the recipe, so I'll pass those out. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And you guys, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go through this pretty quick. So I want to point out some Swiss chard, right? I actually brought rainbow chard because, as I was saying, to incorporate a colorful arrangement of fruits and vegetables, this is a good way. You know, Swiss chard is a green leafy vegetable, but these stems. So this would be a green leafy vegetable. We would, you know, chop it up and saute it. Raise it like we would use spinach. Swiss chard cooks down really, really quickly. You know, more rigid things like kale are going to take a little bit longer. Mustard greens will take longer. But this is a really easy one to incorporate in the diet. Um, there's a lot of calcium in here, a lot of vitamin C, right? So it's really nutritious. But then you have the stems, right? These stems can be cooked like celery. So saute them and put them in soups, saute them with onions. And so that's where that comes in with those guys. Um, Sweet potatoes, so what I made here, I'm just gonna show you. So what I made here is a sweet potato hash, right? Onions, Swiss chard, and black beans. So this would not be a complete protein because there, we don't have a grain with it. So if we, if we just serve this over a grain, over a bed of you know, polenta, right? We have our grain, our black beans, so we have a complete protein. We have a lot of superfoods in there, right? This was a really easy one. So all I did was roast the sweet potatoes to make this, and you all have the recipe, and I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. But you would saute, or uh, roast your sweet potatoes. You wanna make sure that you cool them completely, so I would recommend doing it a day ahead of time. So see how now it's firm? Whereas if I took it out roasted, right, I would just stick my finger right in there. So the starch is gelatinized again, and it'll make it easier for you to be able to chop, and then easier to saute, because you're starting it from cold. So you would saute this, get it nice and brown, and then there's onions in that recipe. Um, once the Sweet potatoes are all browned up. Throw in your black beans and your Swiss chard. Just finish cooking it down. I like to use canned beans. Um, that's just my preference. I like the texture better. You can cook your own beans at home. So you want to make sure you soak them first and then cook them. Um, if you use canned beans, make sure you rinse off the liquid that they're packed in, right? And then make sure you bring them to a boil. Make sure you heat them all the way through. So that dish right here, I'll just show you. Let's just put that on the plate right here. So. So this is a really simple one, and you want to make sure that you consider your portion sizes on here. So I'm using this as my starch, right? So however many, you know, exchanges you got are um, for your portion size, however you plan your diet, you want to make sure to consider that you have two types of starch in here, right? You have your beans and you have your sweet potatoes. And then all I did was just roast a pork loin. So salt and pepper it. Um, I didn't sear it, I just put it in a really hot oven. So 
So then we would have, you know, roasted pork with sweet potatoes. There's a recipe um, to say with applesauce. So the applesauce I would do is just saute caramelized more onions and then touch toss chopped up apples in there, put a little bit of thyme in there and let it cook down and then just serve that right over that guy. All right? So that's our first dish. Really simple, right? That's a really fast dish too to be able to make. Uh, onions. Just start onions and once they start to caramelize, throw diced apples in there and just let it cook down. Throw a little bit of fresh thyme in. Yep. Um, I did a similar dish for actually for Thanksgiving last mm -hmm. year. Um, I just omitted the beans and threw in some um, agave and uh, dried fruit and replaced uh, the sweet potato casseroles that you mm -hmm. so often see at oh, Thanksgiving awesome. dinners. So I just highly recommend that to try to move your family away from the marshmallows. Uh, and that candied sweet potato dish. If you're from the south. <laughs> okay. So I have, really I'm going to make, so this is our post activity dinner, right? After we're done exercising, we want to sit down, we want to have more protein, we want to have a good amount of carbohydrates. You want to think about it that your, your cells are going to just absorb all of that nutrition. And so you want to have really nutrient rich sources of carbohydrates on there. So we have the sweet potatoes and we have the black beans. We got fiber in there. We want to have fiber after exercise. We don't want to have too much fiber before exercise because it, it can cause cramping, right? Something that's really heavy, we want to keep after. Do you have a question? No. Oh. All right, so, so there's that guy. Put him here. We got through this. I'm going to do our, our before, right? So I'm going to make quinoa tabbouleh. I am going to show you the prep here. I just top and tail my tomatoes, right? You can chop those up if you want. This is a really good technique for chopping anything, right? It's just creating planks, right? So I know some people take their tomatoes and they cut slices and they go back and cut the rings. But what I do is just create planks, right? So I have this, this plank, right? And so we can do this with anything, with sweet potatoes, with onions, with carrots, right? And then go back, you cut the planks the size you want, and then come back, and then you just create squares out of it. So one of the things here, I just do some fundamental. Yeah, essentially you're just chopping it up, right? It's all going to the same place. Nobody's <laughs> judging you on your your knife skills at home, but that just makes it a little bit easier. One thing too, when you're cutting, right? You want to make sure your thumbs back. Use like a claw action, and I only use this this knuckle right here as my guide. So my knife is always touching that knuckle, but everything else is is far back from that. So no matter if I'm cutting forward or if I'm cutting backward. I'm just using that front piece of my hand to guide. All right. So Eric, you're preparing the pre-workout? This is our pre-workout, yep. So this is a snack. Mm -hmm. You know, with me, with, a, with you know, having kids, anything I can prep one mm -hmm. day a week to have ahead of time, so yeah. toss this together. Right. So what I would say is well, so yeah, you are the, so things that are whole are going to be more nutritious. As soon as you, you cut something, it gets exposed to air, it starts to oxidize. Right? So yeah, you are exposing so like it. Cooking your whole grains on Sunday, you have them for the whole week. Mm, that's something I don't, I think is okay. More so your fruits and vegetables are things that are right, going to oxidize faster. You could do, so no, yeah, totally. So, um, you know, that's the way that I prep this. And I'm going to show you, right, is I cooked off all my quinoa. So this is something you can do is have your quinoa all cooked off. And then at the last second, just cut the amount that you need for your, um, your vegetables. I wanted to keep this whole so I could show you an English cucumber, right? Sometimes referred to as hot house cucumbers. I, they're a little bit more expensive, but I prefer this type of cucumber because the skins are thinner, right? And you can eat the seeds, right? So I don't have a problem, you know, just chopping the whole guy up. I would do the same thing, right? Create my plank. Right? And then just come back and just rough chop the planks. Mandolins are also fun and fast. <laughs> they are, yeah, totally. Just watch your fingers. So I'm building this with the vegetables part first, right? Um, but notice that I'm building colors in there, right? Red and green are two very um, attractive colors or strong colors. So I have my, 
tomatoes. I have my cucumber in there. Mm -hmm. I chopped up olives, right? So there's two ways we can do this. We're going to have Kalamata olives, make sure they're pitted, right? These are monounsaturated fat, but there's also salt in here, right? Mm -hmm. One thing I like to do is I use salty ingredients in my dishes as opposed to using a lot of salt, right? So in addition, you're going to get the sodium, but you're also going to get flavors. Cheese, caper, caper berries, olives are really good salty ingredients because they add flavor as well as salt. So what I did was just cut it in half and then cut those halves again to the center, right? So cut it down the middle, right? And then I just cut those three times or I can take it and I'll cut this in half once, right? And then just cut each side in half again and cut it in half. So then I would get eight. Right. So tomatoes, cucumbers, olives. I'm not going to show you the chopped parsley I was going to, but for the sake of time, um, we're going to, I have all this chopped parsley, right? So parsley is a good flavor enhancer. Parsley is really great because it's good for digestion. It helps freshen your breath, right? Rosemary is a great herb for helping um, with heart health. Is anyone familiar with cinnamon in here? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Cinnamon, I'm hoping everyone knows. To eat more, get more cinnamon in our, in our diets. All right. Um, I am gonna throw some feta cheese in here, right? So this is more for, I wouldn't recommend putting the feta in for a pre-workout if you're gonna eat it right before you work out because then the dairy might be unsettling in the stomach if you're working out. But when you're having this just in general, you know, you can put the feta in there. It's another salty ingredient, just like cheeses, right? So we're gonna get some flavor in there. We're gonna get a little bit of dairy in there. So here's a good, um, you had a question for me. What prep can we do ahead of time? I always keep fresh lemon juice, squeeze all the lemons, put them through a, pos through a fine strainer and keep the juice and keep it in a squeeze bottle. Mm -hmm. Lemon juice is a flavor enhancer, right? So it helps us, the acidity helps us add less salt to things. And so it's just a really simple one there. So we'll put a little bit of that. I am going to put a little bit of salt in this just to, to bring out the flavors of things that aren't in the cheese, you know, that aren't in the olives. And then we have that, right? So that's our base, right? You can see lots of colors. We see the nutrients in there. Top that with a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, right, a liberal amount of olive oil. Yeah, totally. And then I have my quinoa. Can you help? No, I'll make a, a big batch too. So then we're just gonna, you know, we start with that base and then see how much quinoa either you're gonna use or how much you're gonna add in there. So the, the different color quinoa, does it matter? They... Oh no, that's a good question. So is black quinoa, red quinoa, white quinoa? Are they have the same basically. They have different flavors actually. Um, not like, I thought sure, I was, was going to say lot. fruit loops, yeah, <laughs> no, it's not like that. <laughs> they have different textures and different flavors. Black quinoa is a little bit more earthy, a little bit more chewy. Red quinoa um, is kind of a, kind of in between the two of these, and then white quinoa is, or yellow quinoa is really soft. When you cook quinoa, you want to make sure the tails all come out. And so like I said, it's a two to one ratio. Start it in liquid and cold water, bring it to a boil. Um, once it boils, lower the heat, stir it, put a lid on, let it simmer for 20 minutes, and then let it sit, turn the heat off and let it sit for five minutes. Are there any nutritional differences in the different colors or any mixed colors of quinoa? Any nutritional differences? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put more quinoa on, don't worry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now we're going to sample this. I'm not just going to show you this one. Yeah. This one's a sample. Do you guys have any questions while I finish this one up? I just have a comment about um, making your own um, flowers. Um, mm -hmm. When I was a kid, we used to go to the flour mill. There was a little one in my hometown. And so it was two stones rolling against each other that made flour. Oh, really? And so then my grandmother also, when she made things like tabbouleh, 
she would um, she had a mortar and a pestle and you might want to consider when you're making your own flowers trying a mortar and a pestle to make your own flowers and see if you get a better result it might work better and when you're mixing your all of your um, of your um, spices she also mixed all of her spices in the mortar and pestle and created a really interesting high volume flavor with very few spices and to the mom that was concerned with like pre-prepping quinoa like to make it easier i looked after it like i lived on the road for a year and i'm also a flight attendant and i actually make this this is like my staple that i bring with me and this might make some of the chefs like cringe because you don't always have to have it cool for it to keep because of the lemon juice and the tomato they say that the salt is going to preserve it pretty well i mean we've being a rock line, like that was a staple for us. Like we could just have the quinoa, keep it out of the sun, come at the end of the night, like throw it in a saute pan, chop up some sweet potato, and go. I my question was more of like a system. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I do my greens once a week, and then there's things, but sometimes, you know, if I'm going to put the kids, just you come home and it just needs to be ready. Yeah, that's like how it is. You know, I make a big batch. So when I do it, I'll do this right. once a week, but. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I definitely like make it, and I make enough for it to last me like a four-day trip. Yeah. All right. I mean, when you consider the alternatives of like fast food. Yeah. So the last thing I have here to show you guys is that that bar, right? And I made it into a, a brick, actually. Right. Um. This has puff millet cereal. You can use whatever gluten-free cereal you want to use in there. So I actually used a cereal that was ground flax seeds, ground cornmeal, millet, and corn, I believe. Corn, flax, buckwheat, quinoa, and amaranth. So you can use any gluten-free cereal you want to do. That one just says puff millet. And then also, what I, when I do when I make it, is I heat the, um, on the yeah, almond butter, agave nectar, the honey, and the salt. And I heat those together. So it's homogenous, and then pour it over the cereal. So these flakes, I crushed up the cereal a little bit so it would hold together a little bit better. And then I mix in the chocolate while it's still warm, not totally hot, but still warm. So the chocolate will melt. There'll still be chunks in there, but it helps bind it. Another thing too, when you look for your nut butter, is they stir. You know, there's a, a natural butter nut butters that you have to stir, but there's no stir. And the reason that they're no stir is because they add palm oil to it, which emulsifies it or sometimes coconut, which will most add it. And I recommend using those ones, because while some people are afraid of palm oil and coconut oil, because they're saturated fats, they're plant-based saturated fats, but they help bind, right? The reason that it's no stir is because it's emulsified, and so it'll help hold together your um, bars to get better, rather than it'll be, it won't be as crumbly if you have that palm, because it'll hold it together, All right? So we're just gonna, I'm gonna now do bars, we just did, I did like power bites for you guys of that same recipe. So it's a super simple recipe. And again, you can use any cereal you want. If you're going gluten-free, just follow the gluten-free guideline that's a gluten-free cereal. So just